we will talk about things that we experience that we can do that really kind of activate, feed the spirit. To feed the body in the U.S. is pretty easy. <laughs> to feed the soul, we'll talk about that, is, is something that uh, is different than feeding the spirit. There's a slight difference which I, I will explore with you, if you would like, uh, in the icons, in the scriptures, in the tradition, the liturgical texts. So, I need to I need to kind of navigate my, this is a work of course when you want it to work, but it's okay. Slide number two. So, thinking about a cruise ship, I thought about people spending $20,000 to learn some, you know, some mental science. Also recently, you may have heard that a fairly famous American, in some circles, Hank Hanegraaff, AKA the Bible Answer Man, <laughs> good, good nickname to have. <laughs> Hank Hanegraaff, lo and behold, announced he had become Orthodox. Wow. He also has cancer, so pray for him. And also the radios that we carry show said, you're Orthodox now, oh, your show is, is off the air. So it was a sacrifice for him. I think he knew that he was perhaps going to die, he had to die, an Orthodox Christian, proclaiming what he had found. The answer of the Bible to a man or a woman is the church. And that was a powerful message. And then I read an article about Hank, and he said, you know, my journey began years and years ago when I went to China, and I discovered Chinese Christians. And among the Chinese Christians, now the largest Christian country in the world, think of it, that they really venerate, to use an orthodox term, an author named Watchman Nee. Yes. All right. Now, Watchman Nee, oh, that's interesting. My dentist, who is an Orthodox Christian, was just reading Watchman Nee and every Sunday telling me, have you read Watchman Nee yet? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read Watchman Nee. And so it's interesting how Watchman Nee was not an Orthodox. How could he be Orthodox? He was in China. He just you know, was reading the Bible. But he discovered three fundamentally Orthodox ideas. One is the church is local. Now we forget that sometimes, that's our theology, the church is local. It's the city church, the bishop, the presbyters, the deacons, the people, the Alleluia, the Eucharist, the Amen, that's the whole church. Then we have churches. The church is a local, in the Bible the church is in Corinth, in Rome, Thessaloniki, Damascus, Jerusalem, that's the church. Then you have, in fact, a metropolia, an archdiocese, a patriarchate. And those are made of churches. And that's our theology. We just some, sometimes we just forget it. Right? We say, oh, the church needs a new coat of paint. I know, the temple does, right? And the church is, is not the building. So there was that, uh, the local church. He also discovered the importance of thinking, at least, about spirit, soul, and body. He says, we, in common practice, we don't really distinguish the soul from the body. It's true. But so sometimes we should. And I think that's true. And that led Hank Anagraph somehow to become orthodox. He also discovered theosis. And so a big theme in his books is, in fact, theosis, a very profoundly orthodox teaching. And then, as you know, these things were coming my way. I was standing and came Lent and we, we sing, and as the priest I chant, uh, this text among many texts which you will recognize, I hope, right? Alas, wretched soul. Do you talk to your soul often? <laughs> Interesting, huh? Because in the scriptures we do. Alas, wretched soul, why are you like the first Eve? For you have wickedly looked and been bitterly wounded, 
and you have been touched, and you have touched the tree, and rashly tasted the forbidden food. And there's all of this imagery, this this spiritual, allegorical rereading of Genesis and the entire Old Testament. Right? And it was like, wow, there's a lot of of interesting information that the church has in in the depth of these texts, and we just read them, or it's like, and it, sometimes we want to stop and say. Is my wretched soul like the first Eve? Hmm? And we'll talk about that. And then, of course, at the time of uh, of Lent as well and Pascha, uh, I was looking at the icon for the Samaritan woman. Uh, you've seen that icon, right? Can you describe it? If not, I have it. Uh, I have it uh, as the proposed. Uh, book cover and you'll see it then okay. what in the world is this icon about what do you see I mean you see well you see a place and that place is a very special place what place is this it's John Gospel of John chapter 4 as I recall it's Jacob's well right. what happened there in the Old Testament. It's where Jacob found his wife Rebecca. It's where Jacob, aka Israel, found his wife Rebecca. I think that's a reason why the Lord went to that to that place, a special place. And in fact, if you really look at the Gospel of John carefully, you can spend what fifty years trying to to discover the, the beauty, the layers of that gospel. There's <coughs> There's the theme of Jacob Israel is very strong in the Gospel of John. Have you noticed? You will see the Son of Man, you know, and the angels ascending, descending, kind of evoking the Jacob's ladder. Then the conversation: Are you greater than our our ancestor or father Jacob? What is the answer? Yeah. I see the theme is, and then if you read the book of Wisdom of Solomon, which sometimes we don't read because we have a Bible that doesn't have it, which is really a crime. So if you read Wisdom of Solomon, uh, you have the story about the the journey, the journey of Jacob, and wisdom being being the God in the journey. There's a lot of interesting uh, symmetry there. So the Lord arrives, and I see this icon, and I. And then I read the text for what we, you know, I've been a priest 12 years, uh, Orthodox 22. I've read this this parable many, many times. And then I look at it, what, what is this? I'm not, I, I, have I ever really looked at this icon? Sometimes we, like, what, what is this? What is it? Outside. What, what is this? being outside of something. It could be, so I'll give you my, my interpretation. And uh, this is not meant to be dogmatic teaching. It's meant to be reflection of someone on this icon. So, but here's what I think happens. Um, this woman, name unknown until we know the name, that's afterwards. So this woman has been looking for satisfaction in, in, in all these earthly things of the body. She's had... How many husbands? Five, five. five husbands. Five. But now the man that she has, she's still trying after five. <laughs> <laughs> so still trying, and she has husband number. He's not, 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 not a husband even. And is six a a number of of divine heavenly plenitude? It's really human imperfection. And now she's going out trying to satisfy her earthly thirst. And finally, she meets who? She meets the bridegroom. She meets the true bridegroom of her soul. She meets the one, the seventh one, that really is going to, to fulfill her, not with earthly water, but with, with the ever-flowing spiritual water of the Spirit.
And she becomes, in Greek, what's her name? She becomes illumined. The soul is illumined and encounters the bridegroom and becomes one with the bridegroom. And that is what we seek. So when we talk to, when I say my soul, my wretched soul, I think we have to mean it. We have to mean it. And so this icon, I believe, and I could be completely wrong, but I think it's what it's, it's supposed to be. This is the bridal chamber. And sometimes we have so much imagery of the wedding and the bridegroom and the bride that we don't even see it anymore. Even though it is the central imagery of our unity with our God. The Bible, the scripture, it begins with, with a wedding. Adam and Eve is the, the fulfillment of that, of being a, a true human being, so it's Adam and Eve. And then, uh, we can talk how that goes, that goes really badly quickly, right? There's polygamy, and there's all kinds of problems. And then there's this book, which evokes what it could be, and could have been in the Bible. And that book is, it's a little book that we skip over because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a little bit intense. What book is that? The Song of Solomon. And what kind of a book is that in the, in the scriptures? When you think about it. So, if you think of it, I mean, yes, the, the Lord is called the Great Solomon. Solomon was almost like Adam in a way. He was glorious. He gave name to animals. He was wise, right? He had a temple like Eden. And he had a mother who taught him wisdom, namely Proverbs 31. Right? Who is the king of Emmanuel, according to the Jewish tradition in, in Proverbs 31? The king who hears his mother say, my son, you're going to find something, find, find one, not 1,000, good, good wife. That's the wisdom of the mother given to, to the prince of the king. And so some Solomon is, uh, is what could, should have been right? for Solomon. And I don't know if he actually ever experienced that that love with that uh, that uh, darkish, you know, um, black but beautiful uh, princess. Right? Some believe that uh, it evokes that when he was first married with that Egyptian princess and truly experienced uh, something grand. But then you know what happened to Solomon. He did not fulfill the the wedding spiritual paradigm at all, and it destroyed him. God's mercy probably saved him, as we believe, you know, but, uh, but you can see how he failed. Even though he had wisdom to choose that one, that one bride. When comes um, uh, Dormition, which in fact is coming <laughs> on the old calendar, if I'm correct, or am I not? Uh, when was Dormition on the old calendar? Is it coming? Or, uh, it's been one year somewhere. You know, um, one day I was reading the Song of Solomon. I had a reason to read that book. Let me tell you this. I was looking for the word wedding in my Bible. So I have a Bible. It's called Bible Works. And you all have Bible Works, right? Or you, you should all have an online computer Bible. It'd be such a, a shame to live in today's world, to have you know all kinds of apps, and not the Holy Scriptures. Right? It would really be sad. So, our Bible works was given to me years ago, and uh, I was thinking about the theme of, of, of the wedding. And what I do often is I say, what is the first time in the scriptures that this one word appears? It's always interesting. It never disappoints me. It's always meaningful. For example, uh, our big enemy is sin. Wouldn't you want to know the first time that the Bible mentions sin? 
None of that be useful. Just we're trying to overcome sin. And that verse uh, is an amazing verse. It's in Genesis 5, verse 4. And since we are Orthodox Christians, and we have Bible works or something, we look at it in the Greeks of Tuagent and in the Hebrew. Because we need both to be fully informed. That's right? so like the, the two lungs of, or the two sides of our brain, right? the Hebrew and the Greek. And in the scene, it's Cain is jealous. He is jealous and angry, and I think believes that God doesn't love him. How foolish. Because his sacrifice wasn't accepted, but Abel's was. And so God comes to him and says, and I'm going to paraphrase using the Septuagint. It's a loose paraphrase, right? Sin is like a grizzly Kodiak bear, like a monster crouching at the door, trying to devour you. Be still. The Greek is Hezekias. Hezekias. Be still. This shall be your means of escape, and thus you will have mastery over it. You can ask if in Kodiak you have to play dead or run when a bear shows up. <laughs> but, but there's, see, there's, there's an image. If, if we have our emotions are, are f filled with insanity, jealousy, pride, I am unloved, and whatever it is, and then God says, be still. And this will be your means to escape the, the prowling attempts of sin to, to enter into your, into your being. Be still. It's what our holy fathers and mothers do on the mountain, right? They cultivate Hezekiah, which comes from the very first verse in the Bible that deals with sin. How amazing is that? But uh, also amazing to me is the first word, or the first verse with the word wedding isn't in Genesis. It's not anywhere until Song of Solomon. Well, that's really interesting. What is that verse about? And when I read the verse, I had uh, kind of a revelation, which I want to share with you. So um, it says that on the day of his joy, when the king receives his bride with the the, the, the parade. His mother will be at his right side and will place the crown upon his head. That's an incredible verse. Because every Dormition feast, we proclaim our the churches and therefore ours belief, intuition that when the Lord returns, uh, the Theotokos. The Queen Mother is with him to receive the bride, the church, and she's there kind of placing that crown, that moment of joy when the Lord returns. So of course she is with him, body and soul. And so you could say, where's Dormition and Assumption? Right? Solomon 3, uh, 3.11. It's, it's, you understand the fulfillment of that imagery. And then I really realized one thing which is difficult to do, it's about culture, is that we have to become spiritual Israelites. It's fine if, uh, you know, Frenchmen not eat French fries uh, for breakfast, <laughs> but our true culture is to be spiritual Israelites. Isn't that true? So all of these, these themes, they, they're ours. The, the stories are our stories. They're not the stories of the Jews today. They're our stories. It's our book. It's unthinkable that, that we don't know the book. It's, it's, it's our people. It's our story. It's, we are Abraham's people. We have been grafted on this tree. And when we read the scriptures, we read it spiritually the way spiritual Israelites read the scriptures. And notice uh, the theme also in the Gospel of John. The Jews, the term Jews, the Gospel of John, is not a good term in general. The Jews, fear of the Jews, right? But when Nathaniel approaches to become an apostle, right, this is an Israelite indeed. A 
who there is no God. See, we're, we are called to become Israelites. St. Paul writes to the Hebrews, not to the Jews. So that's, so we need to, to be familiar with the temple and this entire culture because it's, it feeds us. It's how we think. We understand how the Theotokos relates to the Lord Jesus because we are steeped in this culture. When Solomon is enthroned in, in Kings and his mother, Bathsheba, enters with a request. So, so the king stands up and calls for a throne to be placed at his right hand side for his mother. That's the way a, an Israelite prince, Solomon, or Jesus Christ, will treat the Queen Mother. In fact, if we are steeped in the culture, the Queen Mother, the Gebera, isn't the wife of the king, it's the mother of the king. You can look in the Old Testament for Queen Mother. If it's a good translation, you'll see many examples of tell the king and the Queen Mother. So that's the structure of the kingdom of God in, in, the, in, the, in the mind of David. So we, we understand those things. So this really made me think about how to try to read the scriptures carefully. Carefully because, of course, St. Paul and the fathers do allegory, but they don't deny that this is historic. I think the danger is when we allegorize and say, therefore, it never happened, right? It's just a, a story, uh, like a tale, with a message. Now, the Lord really went to Samaria, really met this woman, really had this conversation. And there's a lot of teaching for us about it, what we seek. But there's this allegorical reading, which I think is legitimate, and I think the icon portrays, which is... When will our soul stop looking for happiness, satisfaction in these earthly things and sometimes even relationships with broken human beings and finally say enough is enough and turn to the Lord, the bright will of our souls and be illumined and finally be never thirsty again. So that's what it's supposed to tell us. But think about this, uh, this wedding theme. Uh, you know, if you have a festival, and we do, it's a great time to to make people that are neighbors or come to, to you know buy a euro enter an Orthodox church, and they say, "What is this structure about? What what is it supposed to teach? Something, right? I mean, there's a reason why we we do things the way we do. Why we put the icon." in this order, why do we have the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have John the Baptist, the Theotokos, and <coughs> isn't there a reason for all this? Why we enter by the Archangel Gabriel, but we exit by the Archangel Michael? Is it just a random? No. So we get to tell people that this is meaningful. This is meaningful. Now, it's true. You could stand in Orthodox Church all your life, and never even wonder why we enter by, by the Archangel Gabriel, why do we exit by St. Michael, why do we have to have John the Baptist, or we could have someone else at this particular position. Right? We could just never, never ask. But even if we don't, I think we're still taught something. That's how it, it works for centuries, even when people can't really read or write, or it continues to teach us spiritually without the need for words. That's amazing. But think about it. The iconostas is an invitation to enter into the bridal chamber. You have the Lord, the bridegroom, and we call him this way, enough, right? So we know that he is the bridegroom. You have services that are some of the, the highest moments of our year, those bridegroom matins. And we try to, to teach our, our soul to, to realize who the Lord is. And so there's the, the Lord, the bridegroom. There is the mother of the king, Song of Solomon, 3.11, who is at the right, who is 
kind of leading us as, as bride into the bridal chamber, which is the sanctuary where we, where we commune with the Lord. There's the best man right there, right? In front of the bridegroom. Right? And so every single service, we are spoken to spiritually without words. It's just, th this is, this is the, the love that you seek. Now perhaps for a man, in today's world, like, oh, I'm supposed to be in, in to have love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. I mean the the a great example is is the Apostle John. <laughs> he so much loved the Lord that he placed his head on the Lord's heart on his chest. Right? That's the intimacy. This is not weird. This is who we want to be. Right? And that level of intimacy is really uh, what we seek to, we seek to enter into that, that, that bond so that when the Lord returns or we just simply die, and we really have been the bride. Uh, so when, when, when it's time, we know who we are. And we, we spent our energies you know, to love the bridegroom, to wait for the bridegroom. And, and, and having our souls be really illumined, filled with light. Not dragged by, by the things of the body. And so I want to talk about, about this you know, a little bit. So that was my uh, spiritual uh, encounter with this theme through this particular icon, which I'd never really noticed before until then, until last year. And of course, you know, the life-giving waters uh, are coming out from the well, and of course, through the cross, we conquer sin, and we really enter into this, this, this ever-flowing spiritual life. It's really an amazing icon. So I'm going to go back now to my uh, to my slides. All right. So I'm at point number five. One slide per evening. There's only a few lectures, but we'll see where we go. And so as I was reading about the soul, the body, the spirit, the mind, the heart, and there's a lot of books on the topic. I discovered something really interesting. So let me ask you a strange question tonight. Because people ask me this kind of silly question, but are you Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, you'll see tonight, there's, it does make a little bit of sense. You'll see why that is. Right? So I guess tonight I am Russian Orthodox, not just a French no affiliation, but I'll tell you why that is. Plus our church is uh, OCA, and we are historically in Eureka, in the diocese that St. Innocent uh, ruled. Humboldt Bay, where I live, was first sounded by the Russian American company. How interesting. St. Innocent sailed uh, our coastline in 1836 on his way to Fort Ross. When people came from Europe to settle Eureka in 1850, St. Innocent said it's time for us to go. And he moved his cathedral, his sea, back to Siberia in 1850. How interesting. He then went to Moscow, eventually became the Metropolitan. He died in um, 1879, as I recall. And our temple was built, it's the oldest standing temple in Eureka, built in 1883. It's called the First Church. Well, we are the First Church. Right? <laughs> so, um, there's a connection there. But So I discovered, I went to Platina. You know where that is? That wonderful monastery that was, uh, uh, that's about two and a half hours away on the highway next to my house, 36. And I spoke with Father Damascene, mm -hmm. famous for Christ the eternal Tao, right, among other things, right? He's the abbot there. And he said, well, and I said, oh, I'm reading this book by Saint Theophan the Recluse. It's called The Spiritual Life. Who has read this book? Saint Theophan the Recluse, The Spiritual Life. So, not enough, but you will. You will if you can, because it's out of print. 
Now, I asked Father Damascene, so and where's the book? I want to buy you know, a case of about 2,000 volumes to share with my friends. And he said, it's out of print. And there's some difficulties uh, reprinting it. I said, really? Uh, he said, yeah. He said, uh, the, the Greeks don't really like it. I said, how interesting. <laughs> It is interesting. And when I was then doing research, I discovered why that is. Very interesting. Um, now, it's very rare that the, the Russian church disagrees with the wider, you know, the Greek churches, right? Very rare. There's one example that I came across, but it's really kind of a, a fluke, is uh, in the Catechism of St. Philaret of Moscow. When they list the books of the Bible, right, the, the Catechism treats the uh, Durkanonical uh, to the side of it, right, following St. Athanasius. The Greek tradition doesn't really do that. But in practice, the Russian church, when they print the Bible, they have all the books in there. So have a little star that says, let's do the Durkanonical, which is fine. So it's not really a disagreement, just the way they, they categorize things a bit. But it's the same result. But here, very clearly, the Russian Orthodox tradition separates, or at least is willing to focus on the spirit and the soul and the body. Right. Like a triune approach to the human person. And I'll show you some examples. And certainly, St. Theophan, his entire book is really explaining how that works for your benefit. How you can use this knowledge about, about your spirit and even the, the, the in-between layers, the mind, the heart, the soul, to achieve, with God's help, spiritual progress. He writes to people that are struggling, that are often young people that want to go to a monastery, and they, they're influenced by political I ideas and ideals, and, and they're, they're going up and down spiritually. And the book is letters that use theology to encourage people. It's a wonderful book. So uh, if it's back in print, it will be, I'm told, uh, by St. Vladimir's, uh, you know, buy it. However, if you read modern day uh, books from Greece, you will not find this, this emphasis on spirit, soul, and body. What will you find? Well, you will typically find uh, the noose or the mind and the heart being discussed. Here's what happened, I believe, because okay? I was kind of studying this, and so like, really the, the Greeks don't seem to like it. In fact, uh, they, they have a different focus, and you'll see it works fine. It's just a different focus. Um, I think it's because there was a man in Greece, so his name was Apostolos Makrakis, who was an eccentric man, but of a fundamentalist. He was very bitter against the clergy, and he was this kind of uh, activist, and he wrote many books, um, and he was pushing this idea that there was spirit, soul, and body was a big deal. But he also, in his book, was saying, "Oh, all the clergy are corrupt, and the whole church is gone, you know, to go off the deep end." So, when they condemned Apostolos Makrakis, and the whole bundle got condemned, you know, kind of like with Origen. I mean, poor Origen wrote some silly things, but when he got condemned, and then everything got pushed away, and there's some good things in Origen. I, think, I don't think he meant to be a heretic. It was the early church, he had kind of ideas, he was young, he was speculating, but then, you know, when you then condemn it, then, you know, it's just a dark... So, I think the Greeks ever since are cautious about using this, this triune language because of, of Makarakis. That's my, my understanding. So, not get in trouble. They use really equivalent ideas. The spirit you will see is linked to the mind in a certain way, and the heart is linked to the soul. And so when, you, when they talk about the unity of the mind and the soul, what we will see is really the unity of the spirit and the soul and the body. When, uh, Watchman Nee noticed something. I was happy. He didn't really notice enough. But in his book, The Spiritual Life, I think it's called, twice he says, that's remarkable, and I agree. And we know it so well that we can sing it. Here we go. My soul, and my 
Now, there's two ways to hear this, right? One is to say, it's just repeating the same thing twice, like in kind of a way you would say the same thing twice. But you can also read it, I think it's, it's a valuable reading, to say, for the first time since Adam and Eve, for the first time since Adam and Eve, here is someone, the Theotokos, who has a true unity of spirit and soul. Her spirit, her soul, and I would have to say her body, are really united in fulfilling the will of God. So really salvation begins when she says, of course, you know, the, the fiat, but also that, that beautiful song. And we too, I hope, want this. We want to have this, this the rule of the spirit, the obedience of the soul, and the subduing, or as St. Paul says, the, the pummeling, or the pressing down of the body. Which is why, you know, in the church we fast. We fast to, to, to say the spirit rules. The spirit says when, when you eat. So that's something to think about. Um, St. Seraphim, we'll talk about it, St. Seraphim Asara, one of the great, great teachers of all times. Huh? Beautiful painting. Uh, gave this advice, which uh, I, I've got two daughters, I'm listening to this advice. He said to a father and mother looking for a, a good bridegroom for the daughter, because, you know, back then it would be all arranged. I wish we could do 